Hey, good morning, gang. Hey, it's great to be with you this morning as we continue on in our study through taking this jet tour through the New Testament. And we actually find ourselves this morning at the letter of the first Corinthians, Paul's first epistle to the Corinthian believers. And so encourage you, if you have the time, to go to the website, get a copy of the study guide for first Corinthians. It's the one dated for today. And also, if you have a copy of the study guide for Acts Part 3, we have a blank to fill in there if you haven't already filled it in. So go to there. As I encouraged you yesterday, keep that Acts Part 3 study guide handy because we have several blanks to fill in as we continue on in this study. But this morning, we're looking at the book of 1 Corinthians or the letter known as 1 Corinthians. And so looking forward to our time together. So again, if you have time, go to the website, get that study guide, and be a part of the study this morning. Well, let's pray together, shall we? Father, as I come to you right now, I do thank you for the morning and for the time we have to be together and to travel through this marvelous book. Father, we know that there's there, there are many dynamics and, and, and things about this Corinthian letter that would be good for us to study verse by verse and section by section. But I pray that as we spend this these few minutes together and focus on, on these 16 chapters today, that you'll cause us to see the highlights of this book. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now again, if you have your Acts Part 3 study guide, notice there at Acts 19.10, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians in the year 40, 54, AD 54, from the city of Ephesus. Now, we found yesterday that Paul had made his way to Ephesus. There was an extensive ministry there, and we went, we went through all that. And if you'll look also, if you've found the place there, the book of 1 Corinthians, if you'll look at chapter 16, we have another piece of evidence here that tells us that Paul was in Ephesus when he wrote this letter. Look at verse 8, 1 Corinthians 16, 8. But I will tarry in Ephesus till Pentecost. So he wrote this letter and sends it on. And he uses probably a, a, a man by the name, uh, 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 what we call an amanuensis, uh, Sosthenes, a guy that helps write this letter. It's a big book. It's a big letter. And so Paul had others to help him along the way. The key phrase for the book of 1 Corinthians is Christian living, or how to live the Christian life. So Christian living there would be the key phrase for your study guide, but also a key verse. And I got a couple that you can choose from if you would like to. One is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Notice what we have here. Now I plead with you, brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. What a great verse. That Paul's reminding and just challenging and exhorting the folks there in Corinth to, to walk as one man, to walk in agreement, to be in harmony and peace with each other. Another verse that you might prefer as the key verse is found in chapter 16 and verse 13. Notice there. It says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. I think that's another great verse that depicts the heart of the Apostle Paul as he wrote this letter to the people in Corinth. Now, as has been said in different ways and different times, the Corinthian church was probably one of the most messed up churches in the Bible. They had a lot of things going wrong. They had a lot of things. They were very gifted. In fact, Paul said, you've come behind in no spiritual gift. They had all these spiritual gifts. They had, they had gifted and talented people, yet they had a lot of difficulties, had a lot of situations. And when you look at the outline there on your study guide, we find a unique kind of writing here from Paul. It would be quite typical for Paul to have a doctrinal section and then a practical section. 
maybe even in some cases, a, a more personal section. So that was pretty common. Paul laid out some doctrinal truths and then, then taught people how to, how to apply those truths. Well, notice in your study guide for today, we have two sections, all these chapters, and yet two sections, and they're divided up into two specific areas. Notice point one there, Paul's correction on three tragic abuses in Corinth, and then point two, Christian answers to present problems. Well, let's look at those. In this first point here, of course, the introduction is verses one to nine, you see that. But Paul's correction in three tragic abuses, notice the wording there, this section is Paul's response to a report from Chloe. So look down at, at chapter 1, verse 10. And we just read that 10th verse as one of our key verses, but now look at verse 11. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Contentions meaning quarrels, strife, divisions among you. And so Paul writes this first section to deal with some situations that were, that were brought to his attention by the household of Chloe. Well, the first one there, letter A, is division over leadership. Division over leadership. And there's a couple different places here in the Corinthian letter that helps us see this. Notice, first of all, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 1, 12. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Now, what this was, it's kind of like there was a group in the church that said, well, we just listened to Paul. And others said, well, we just listened to Peter. Well, others, we just listened to Apollos. And some would say, well, we don't listen to those men. We just listened to Jesus. And, and so they, they got this division going on over leadership. And Paul extends, he talks extensively about how they should not be divided over this leadership, that they're all walking as one. Look also at chapter 3. We see another, another indication of this in chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. For when one says, I am of Paul, another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers through whom we believe, as the Lord gave each one. Basically, Paul saying, there's no reason to have all this division over leadership. It's just a, it's a waste of time. We we're all in this thing together. Look also at verses 21 and 22 of chapter 3. Notice what he says there. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's, and so we're all in this thing together. So Paul deals with their division over leadership. Letter B, a problem or problems with immorality in the church. Immorality in the church. Now, very specifically, this was a very jaded situation. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. I will have to explain that. That was not the way it was supposed to be. And so we got a situation going on here. Now, when you read through this and study through this, there's a lot of detail. But let me give you the, what we have here in a nutshell. Basically, the problem was, yes, the immorality was bad. What was worse was the church was just turning a blind eye to it. And rather than addressing the situation, they were just like, well, we know it's not good, but we don't know what to do with it. It's kind of like when a, when a church doesn't deal with the situation because they're afraid if they deal with the situation, they might lose a church member over it. And so they just let it happen. Well, that's what was going on here. And Paul said, that's not good. And notice what he says here. Here's his prescription to dealing with the problem. Deliver such, verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that this spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So they were, he's basically saying you need to deal with this thing and deal with it head on. It's very difficult in our day-to-day -to, -day to carry out church discipline. People don't like to be called on the carpet. They don't like to be questioned. They don't like to be challenged in their decision-making. But here we have a very important situation here. 
Letter C here is lawsuits in pagan courts. Lawsuits in pagan courts. And, and a way to, to summarize this is chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. And so let me kind of give you a, a uh, again, a summary of this. Let me give you a, a current day picture of how this might happen. Let's say at the church, somebody backs their car into another person's car and breaks out a taillight. Well, rather than the two believers working this out among themselves and, and rectifying the situation, they were dragging each other to court. And they were taking each other to court and, and having court sessions over minor issues. And what Paul would, be, would say here is, it would be better, it, it, rather than dragging this thing into court, into pagan courts where you got a pagan judge making a decision over believers or for believers, it would be better to give up your right in situation and just take care of the taillight yourself. And these were minor situations of Christians taking Christians to court, suing each other over minor situations that was causing a division in the fellowship and Paul said that's not good. Another thing we see here in this section of chapter 6 is the makeup of the church. And if you read down through here, if you read 9 through 11, you see some different kinds of people in the church. People with different kinds of lifestyles and different kinds of decision making. But notice how Paul concludes that in verse 11. He says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So what we have here, people came to church with different kind of baggage, so to speak, but they'd given their lives to Christ and now they'd been born again and now they were new in Christ and, and Paul was, was exalting the Lord in that matter. Well, now we come to point two in the letter, and Christian answers to present problems. And that covers chapter 7 through chapter 15. Now, notice this one, if you find there in chapter 7, verse 1. This section is Paul's response to a letter from the church. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And this begins then... Point letter A there, guidelines for marriage. And in chapter 7, Paul gives some pretty clear and pretty specific guidelines as it relates to marriage and couples' fellowship with each other and, and, and divisions and all those kinds of things. So you can read through chapter 7. Letter B, he talks about eating meat offered to idols. Now, if you look at chapter 8 and verse 4, we have a situation that has multiple applications. Look at chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. So what Paul is saying is there's really only one God. He's the real, the living, and true God. An idol is dead, whether it's made of wood or stone or whatever it's made out of, it, it's dead. It can't do anything to anybody. Now, here's the situation. People who worshiped these idols were offering meat as sacrifice to these idols. Well, the people who were, you might say, in charge of the temple, and we're kind of giving some you know, just kind of a basic picture here. It's kind of like out the back door, they were selling that meat for pennies on a dollar. And so people were bringing in this prime A1 kind of steak and meat to the temple and presenting it to these false gods, these idols. And then the, the, the idol worship manager was taking that meat out the back door and selling it to Christians or selling it to whoever for pennies on a dollar. And so a question was raised, should we be eating this meat that's been offered to an idol? 
Well, Paul said, and that the point here, verse 4, is basically an idol is dead. It can't do anything. It can't taint the meat. It can't touch the meat and infect the meat. It can't do anything to it. So the meat has not changed. No big deal. However, if you have a weaker brother, if you have a person who says, oh, I would never eat that meat off of that idol. Man, that's down there and that, that idol. Man, I would never eat any of that. It would be better for you, for the conscience of your weaker brother, that you not, in other words, when you have him over to your house, don't serve him any of that meat. That's okay. If, if you and your family are, are good with that, you can eat it. Because again, if the idol can't affect it, can't infect it, can't touch it, can't taint it. But when you bring a younger, weaker brother into the picture and he says, oh, that, oh, we should never do that. It'd be better, once again, to give up your rights and not eat that meat offered to that idol for the conscience, or the scruples of your weaker brother. And so that's the whole context there. Of, and, it's, and it's kind of in line with things in the Christian life. You may hear people say this, sometimes, well, this is wrong for me to do. It may not be wrong for you, but it's wrong for me. And you have these kind of situations where different people have different scruples and different things in their conscience and their heart about issues. And so when we have that situation, we should never belittle someone else or you know exalt ourselves above them if they were to think something is a sin then we should not do anything to force them into violating their own conscience so hopefully that that helps there many applications to this thing even though we we don't have to worry about meat being offered to idols many different applications to this principle here then letter C is the veiling of women in public worship. In other words, when a woman goes to church, should you have a should she have a hat on? She have should she have a scarf on? And and they talk he talks about that in in that section in verses two through sixteen of chapter eleven. Then letter D we have instructions for the Lord's supper. Now you have heard these words probably many, many times, if you've been to church many, many times, you've heard these words, and these are Paul's words that have been given to him by the Lord to help us understand how it is that we practice the Lord's Supper. And so we, we see that, and that's, that's very germane to who we are as believers, and we utilize this passage of Scripture quite often. Then letter E, the use of spiritual gifts. And in chapters 12, 13, and 14, we have a, a expansive discussion here on spiritual gifts. Now, the discussion of spiritual gifts is found in other places in the Bible. Romans chapter 12, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4. But this is the most expansive discussion of, an exhaustive discussion of spiritual gifts found in the Bible, 12, 13, and 14. We also find right in the right in the center of this the love chapter, chapter thirteen. So if you study spiritual gifts, this is going to be a, certainly a portion to study. And then letter F, truth about the resurrection. And we have a lot of different applications here. And again, if you ever go to do a study on the resurrection, First Corinthians fifteen is going to be a hallmark chapter for you to study because it has so much to say about what the resurrection is and what it's not, what we're looking forward to, the glorified body, and all those kind of things talking about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In fact, go there if you would in your Bible, because in 1 Corinthians 15, we have one of the most concise statements about the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 1, notice, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you receive in which you stand, by which also you're saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, 
and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. There is a very specific, easy to understand, concise way of reading about the gospel. First Corinthians 15, a great, great chapter. And then the conclusion of chapter 16. In fact, in chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, is where Pat and I, we utilize this verse on a regular basis to think about how we set aside money for missions. And this is something we do every payday. We set aside money for missions, and then we give that in different times throughout the year. And it's drawn out of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. If you want to know more about that, let me know. I'll talk to you about it. So, great, great book of 1 Corinthians. Well, between now and Monday... I want to encourage you to read 2 Corinthians because that's the next book that Paul writes. So you got a little time with the weekend, read 2 Corinthians. And if you get finished with that, go ahead and read the book of Romans. Start reading the book of Romans because we're going there next. So that'll give you some reading between now and Monday. and look forward to seeing you then. Well, let's pray together, shall we? Father, as we come to you right now, I thank you so much for the time we've been able to be together, how our time flies by, and I pray for us as we continue to study your word. I thank you for Paul's teaching and leading and helping the church in Corinth, and I pray, Father, just remind us how your word is there for us to help us, to lead us, and guide us. And I pray, Father, you bless those who've been watching this morning, those who'll watch this later, you bless them with a great day. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.